It's good to see so many this morning, and thank you for being here. And hopefully, uh, and my prayer is that this sermon will be helpful to you and continue into our, our worship. And of course, be well pleasing to the Lord. Proverbs 22, 6, if you could be turning there, many of you already know it. Maybe some can quote it. I think it's a, a passage that gives a lot of us uh, comfort. And I think it's also a passage that gives a lot of us a lot of grief and a lot of sadness. Um, but as well, I think there's another group of us that this passage brings us a lot of confusion because we did everything we thought we could do, but things didn't work out the way we wanted them to. Proverbs 22.6 is, I believe, a general rule of thumb. And there are exceptions to this rule. And one of the exceptions is the man that, that wrote the rule. But look at 22.6 with me. He says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And of course, it being the Proverbs where it is, there, there's nothing before it or after it that gives any more context. It's a proverb on its own two feet. But the thought is, is if you have a child and you train him up in the way that he should go, well, then when he's older, he's going to stay on that way. And that's the idea of the thought. Is this true for a lot of people? I hope it is. You know, especially you think about the past three years, the way our services have been. You know, our services here are a lot louder than they used to be. There's a lot of crying and there's a lot of talking and there's a lot, of, you know, babies being babies. You know, if these things are going on here, you know, you read passages like this and they give you a lot of encouragement. They give you a lot of hope for the future. Okay, if I can do what I need to do, then when they are old, they will not depart from it. But as well, it would also work for the negative, wouldn't it? If I trained up a child the way that they shouldn't go, would, wouldn't that be the way that they would go? Yeah, I think I could do that too. And finally, at the end, what we'll talk about is there's also exceptions to this rule where you did train up a child in the way that they go, and they did depart from it. And I think one of the examples is, like I already said, the writer of this book. So that's what we'll look at this morning, those three scenarios with this passage. Uh, and then at the end, I want to go to 2 Corinthians, and I want to pull something from the verse there, and the lesson will be yours. The first thing, let's make the point of, is that we often end up surprised as parents, or at least those that are around young adults, that we think, okay, well, this is the way this child's going to be. This is the way that we've trained this person to be. And then we all act surprised when bad things happen. And sometimes we even act surprised when good things happen. Like, well, who taught him that? That's great, <laughs> you know? So what my thought is coming from Proverbs 22, 6 is maybe we shouldn't be surprised when people turn out the way that they turn out in any situation. Let's first start with those terrible ways. Could we train up our child in a terrible way and then they end up in terrible ways? And I think we could start at the worst example ever, which is Lot and his daughters. Look at Genesis 13 with me, the first book of the Bible. Lot is given the option by Abraham to choose where he's going to move. And Abraham, Abraham says he'll go in the other direction. And in Genesis 13, look what Moses says about the area that Lot chose. Starting in verse 12. I'm going to start verse 11. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and he separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. The way you have the story set up is Abraham tells Lot, you know, hey, you go one direction, I'll go the other, and we'll separate like that. Lot sees how green Sodom is, and he says, well, I'm going to go towards this area. And it says that he pitched his tent as far as Sodom. It was almost as if he hadn't really gotten there yet. But Moses warns us, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful before the Lord. When we get to chapter 19 of Genesis, it's no longer that Lot has pitched his tent as far as Sodom. Now, in chapter 19, he's actually living in the city of Sodom. And we can understand, and many of us already know, the things that were going on at Sodom. When two angels come to rescue Lot and his family, the men there try to attack them and try to rape them. And that's the type of people that live here in Sodom. The angels are able to get Lot out. They rescue his family. They tell him to flee to the mountains. They tell him not to turn back and look. But 
As we know, his wife turns around and looks back, and she turns into a pillar of salt. Him and his daughters continue to flee, and if we got to the end of the chapter 19, you end up in like the most horrible section that we usually skip in our kids' classes, which is Lot's daughters so fearful for their lives, you know, hearing behind them Sodom exploding, knowing that their mother has died, their solution for these terrible events is, let's get our father drunk and have an incestuous relationship with him. And maybe that way we'll be able to populate the earth because they think it's the end of the world. Now, let me don't give this girl some credit. They have just went through like a horrifying experience like that most of us will never experience ever in our lives. Let's give them that kind of credit for that. But why was that their solution? Let's get our father drunk. You know, we had just talked to some angels. You know, why wasn't our solution, well, let's give these things to God and, and wait for God to tell us to what to do now. But instead, their solution is this. Well, why is that solution their solution in this terrible way? Did they not learn things like that from the Sodomites? I mean, they're living in the city of Sodom, a city so wicked that God blew it up. And I know, for instance, that Lot was faithful, and I know that these things tormented Lot. But I do have to think that even though in my own household, there's always going to be outside influences outside the door, and those outside influences can influence our children. And so you have a situation here where two girls were brought up in a terrible situation and they end up in a terrible way. Are we surprised? I think Proverbs 22, 6 tells us not to be surprised. And what about in a real world scenario? And I'm trying to bring these things forward to modern day. What about bitter brethren? Do you know their children and, and where their children have ended up? You don't have to turn to Acts 8 unless you like. But then Acts 8, 23, that's when Peter tells Simon, he says that you've been poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And I thought that was a good phrase to understand bitterness. Poisoned by bitterness. This binds you up in iniquity. Do you know bitter brethren? I was looking for anybody to be like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> you know, have we all not had come to contact with brethren that are like Moses in the congregation? And I say they're like Moses because everyone parts like the Red Sea when they walk by. We all try to keep a 10-foot distance. Why? Because they're always looking at the cup half empty. They've got 50 complaints about what's going on at church. They get in fights with people in the foyer, with anyone who's there that can fight with them. Right? They're always looking at everything they see and everything's negative and nothing's positive and there are no solutions offered and certainly no help by their own hands offered. Do we all know bitter brethren? Have those bitter brethren ever come up to you and ask you to study with their kids because none of them are faithful? I have. And I'm willing to study with anybody who wants to study. Don't get me wrong. And that's usually I have to phrase it, well, hey, if that's something that they want, I'm available for that. But we know what I think in Andrew's mind. Well, what am I supposed to do with a few hours that you did with 20 years as you poisoned your children with bitterness? If you're bitter about the local church, you know who else is going to be bitter about the local church? It's going to be everyone you influence in that way. So can you train up your child in bitterness? Yeah, you can. And hey, don't be surprised when they hate this place as much as you do. Don't be looking for something else. Yeah, that's exactly what Proverbs 22 warns us. Well, here's some terrible ways we can train up our children. Let's talk about some good ways we could train up our children. And maybe our best example, of course, is Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Back in the New Testament, Got to go through Thessalonians, then 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, look here talking about his faith and where it originated at. Verse 4, Paul says, I'm greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. Paul says, I want to be encouraged, Timothy, by your faith. It brings me joy to think about the faith in you, Timothy. And then he says, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. 
and I'm persuaded that it is in you also. And the one I want to bring up here is that Timothy has this faith that brings Paul joy, expressible joy. But he says, Timothy, I know that faith didn't just dwell in you all on its own, but it was first in your mother Eunice, and then you got it probably from your grandmother Lois, and that both of these women have had a great impact on your life. And if we kept on reading into second Tim, uh, chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, Paul says, you know, hey, these are things that I have taught you as well. When Timothy thinks about the way that he's at, you know, he's preaching at Ephesus. Evidently, Timothy does have this great faith. Were those things that he was taught? Yes, it was things he was taught. And was it just his parents that taught him that? Well, obviously, his mom had a huge impact on his life. But Luke gives us the expression in Acts that his father wasn't a Christian. So it's not just Timothy's mom that's giving him this faith, but who else is it? Well, it's also his grandparents, right? Grandmama's involved in training up in Timothy the way he should go. And is it only biological family that's involved in Timothy training up as he should go? No, you also have people like Paul that are a big part of the faith that's in Timothy right? And the point that I like to bring up from Timothy is that, and we say this a lot, it does take a village. There's going to be more influential people in your life than just your parents in big ways, just like it was in Timothy's ways. With Lot's daughters, we gave the example about how the people of Sodom probably did have a big influence on Lot's daughters. Well, did the people that Timothy rode up with, did they have a big impact on him too? They did. And obviously for the best way. One more thing I want to bring out of this. You know, when we talk about Proverbs 22, 6, a lot of us aren't married. A lot of us may not have children. And we may think, okay, well, Proverbs 22, 6, this has nothing to do with me. But is everybody here on this list, do they all are married with children? Does Paul have any children? Is Paul married? But does Paul not have a huge influence on this young man? He does, doesn't he? You know, I think about our kids here. Are there not a lot of single people here or maybe people with no kids that you have a lot of influence over my children? You, you do, right? And here's a man that's single that has a huge influence. And I would say he has the most influence of all of single people but I can't say that because the most influential single person on young people was Jesus. He was the most influential single person. So is this not like a community effort? Is this not like a congregational effort to stand for the truth, stand in faith, and instill this faith into our young people so we can train them up in the faith, and when they're old, they will not depart from it? Also to bring that into a real-world scenario, and I put up here devout Greeks. You remember the people in Acts that weren't Christians and they weren't Jewish, but they would want to be a part of what Paul was doing. And Luke would often refer to these people as devout Greeks, that they were there, they were present, and they would want to be a part. Eventually, these devout Greeks became Christians. To give you a real-life scenario story, there was once a man here that began worshiping with us and began studying the Bible with us, and ultimately he obeyed the gospel. What was interesting about this this man, is that his grandmother was very influential in his life. It basically raised him. And his grandmother was part of this denomination in another town, and she was very involved in it. Her father used to be the pastor of this denomination. And obviously, she was still very involved in the work that that denomination was doing. Well, she had told that man, her grandson, her whole life, you need to believe in the Bible. You need to obey the Bible. Whatever is in the Bible, that's God's word, and that's what you do. And she instilled that in him. So you know what he started doing? He started reading the Bible. And he started studying with some of the men here. And they were reading the Bible with him and explaining to him the Bible. And eventually he came to the understanding that the Bible said that he needed to obey the gospel. And so he went and found someone that would help him obey the gospel. And as he continued to read the Bible, he realized that he needed to stop going to that denomination 
and found a church that followed the Bible. And he eventually started worshiping with us instead. Well, Grandmama was angry. Grandmama was upset. Her grandson that she had raised, I mean, like, did a lot of work in this guy. And now he has left the denomination and he's found worshiping with us. And she was upset about that. But talking about Proverbs 22, 6, should she have been surprised that that was the outcome of that situation? When you train your children to believe the Bible, don't be surprised when they start believing the Bible. My understanding is, is that's exactly what he told her one day. You wanted me to believe the Bible. And this is what the Bible says I got to do to be saved. So I'm going to believe the Bible. And many of us in this room too, we have parents that are not Christians, at least not practicing Christians, but they did instill in us things like, you need to believe the Bible. And lo and behold, should they be surprised where we are this morning? No, we're doing the very thing they taught us to do. We're believing the Bible. So this is a situation where you got non-Christians, or at least believers, that could put in good ways into you that would end up where Jesus wants you to be. And and that's a real-life situation of Proverbs 22.6. We've talked about these terrible ways and we've talked about these good ways. Well, let me talk about the exceptions to the rule of Proverbs 22, 6, where you have a situation where you could train up a child with the best parents in the best environment, with the best single people around them to influence them, and yet they are going to go against the grain and they are going to depart from the way. And there's many biblical examples of that. The first one is in a negative sense, and it's the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, right? You can turn to 1 Chronicles. I want to read this in just a moment. 1 Chronicles, 1 2 Samuel, 1 2 Kings, 1 2 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles. Get to chapter 28. This is David at the end of his life giving Solomon some of his final thoughts. Solomon is handed the kingdom from David given by God wisdom and wealth. And for the first several years, he does exactly what God asks him to do. But it seems like as we got closer to the end of his life, because of the influence of others, he begins building these pagan temples all through Israel. The worst of all, it seems, building the temple to Molech, the Moabite God. And as you know later, the Israelites begin offering their own children to Molech, and it seems like Solomon's the one that started this. Look at what David tells the guy who brought Molech to Israel many years before he actually brought Molech to Israel. 28 verse 9, David says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. You know, it really is just a very beautiful thought to leave your children as you're passing off in this world. Did Solomon go in the way that David pointed him towards? No, he didn't. And so we look at things like this and we go, well, hold on just a second. I think Proverbs 22, 6 told us that if we train up our children the way they may go, they shall not depart from it. So why is Solomon forsaken the way that his father David has pointed him? Well, obviously, there's been outside influences. And also, obviously, Solomon is allowed to make his own decisions. And evidently, Solomon has made the choice to bring in gods like Molech into Israel. And he has forsaken the Lord, and what did David guarantee? Well, then he will cast you off forever, and it seems like that's exactly what God did to Solomon. I have some hope reading Ecclesiastes, but as far as kings, that's as far as I can go. Now, to reconcile this in such a terrible situation, when Solomon was constructing these pagan temples, do you think that David's words ever troubled him, though? Do you think as Solomon is building this temple to Molech, do you think by any chance that maybe he would quietly think to himself, you know what, my dad would have hated this. You know what, if my dad was alive, 
He would have gotten all the mighty men. He would have burned this place to the ground. Do you think Solomon ever was troubled by the words and deeds of his father? I'm assuming yes. How do I know that? Because I too get troubled by the words and the deeds of my father. When I do something, I don't need to be doing. So even though this didn't go like we wanted it to, is David still an influence on Solomon even though he's dead and gone? Yes, he is. And Proverbs 22, 6 still is ringing true. Now, this is a negative example. Can you think of a positive example where someone left the way of their parents to go do good instead? And maybe you could think of some better ones, but this is the one that I'm using. What about Moses? And of course, I'm talking about his adopted family. Do you think Moses was ever troubled by the things that he learned for the first 40 years of his life being raised by the royal family in Egypt? Look at Hebrews 11, back to the New Testament. After the Timothys, after Titus, after Philemon. Hebrews 11, verse 24 says, by faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the riches in Egypt. And he looked for the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured seeing him who is invisible. Moses. Moses spends the first 40 years of his life living with his royal family in Egypt as their adopted son. Do you think as the years went on, and now he's guiding the people of Israel into the Canaan land, maybe they're having some bad days where they're complaining and they're acting like those bitter brethren we can't stand, you know, and they're causing him problems. Do you think that it ever troubled Moses for just a moment, that he would think, wow, being in Egypt would be really nice right now. Do you think the words of his adopted mother would have ever ringed in his ears about the things that he was doing instead of being home in Egypt? Would have those things ever troubled him? I'm going to assume yes. Because he had to forsake Egypt. And not only did he have to forsake Egypt, but look at verse 25. He had to choose. That he actually had an option to go back to Egypt. He actually had an option to go to Egypt or to follow God, and he had to make a choice. Which tells me, at least, that there was an influence there that was negative, that was left over from his training. And now he has to choose to overcome. Is Proverbs 22, 6 true? Proverbs 22, 6 is still true. And I was thinking about this with Moses and Solomon, that their memories could have troubled them in the future, that their memories of what their parents and others had instilled in them as young ages, they would have remembered those things in old men and they would have bothered them. And so we're really talking about your memories here when you boil down to it, that your memories can encourage you, your memories can trouble you. When I was thinking about memory, I I somehow thought about this. You know what sense of your body apparently will trigger the most vivid memories? Did did any of y'all know that? Me me and Jason knew that, and me and Jason don't know a lot about things like that. I was very proud of ourselves. I Googled it to make sure we were right. It seems like it's your sense of smell. Your sense of smell usually will trigger the most vivid memories of something you can recall. And it has something to do with the part of your brain that smells is also right by the part of your brain that remembers things. And so it's very quick to get a memory from a sense of smell. So you'll be in a situation, well, maybe you'll go to a gym, you'll go to an old gym, you'll smell the gym floor, and you will all of a sudden be back in high school, right? And there's these smells. Oh, I smell this food. Wow, that reminds me of my mom that would make this dish all the time. You can get triggered real fast by smells. And when I thought about that, I went, oh, well, that's 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 
where Paul is talking about the apostles' work being a fragrance, being a smell. And when you smell the apostles, you smell something, either good or for the worse. Look at 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Just to pause, he's making a Roman example. The Romans would throw on parades. They would throw on triumphs. And a big part of that triumphs is they would spray perfume like those ladies at the store when you walk in the mall, you know, and they would just shoot you with it. And so the thought is here, it's like, okay, well, Jesus is leading us in a parade, and like these Roman emperors, there's a fragrance being put out for the parade. Verse 15, for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, But as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Let me observe three things in this passage. The first one is this. You know, he says that we are the fragrance, and the fragrance is God's knowledge. It's Christ's knowledge, and it goes to every place. And who smells it? Is it just those being saved? No, everybody smells it. Those who are being saved and those who are perishing— Everyone smells the gospel message of the apostles. And and number two, let me bring this out. There's also an understanding that people know that they're sincere. He says, you know we're not peddling the word of God, but we're teaching these things in sincerity. And to bring this thing forward to us, and I know this passage is mainly about the apostles. You know, when you have faith and you're being hypocritical about it, do, do people know? Yeah, people know. But people can spot a hypocrite pretty easily. Now, if you have faith and you're sincere about it, do people know? Yeah, people know. It's very easy to tell, right? Sincere faith is easy to spot, just like the sincere faith of the apostles was easy to spot. Did the saved and those who are perishing, did they both believe that the apostles were sincere? I think that they both believed it. Now, one of them hated him for it, but I think they did believe that the apostles actually meant what they believed, right? And number three, look at this one. He says, verse 16, to the one who we are, the aroma of death leading to death, but to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And what's the thought there? The apostles have done their part in sharing the gospel and sharing their faith. But now it's the part of the the smeller. I don't have a better word. It's the part of the smeller to decide and choose what that's going to smell like. To those that are being saved, what does the gospel smell like? It smells like life, right? Now to the lost and to the perishing, what does the apostles smell like? They smell like death. They smell like something foul because they hate the message that it contains, Right? And that's a good sum up, I think, of what I need out of that passage. Again, this is about the apostles, but I do think Paul would be agree with the application we're going to make from it. We've been talking about how your memories can trouble you from the things that you've been taught, and sometimes those troubling things are encouraging, and sometimes those things actually do trouble you. They, they discourage you from whatever you're doing. I was raised in Prattville, going to Prattmont, the church there. And I guess it's been about 13 years since I I worshiped with them regularly. Do I still smell them? Man, y'all, I smell them all over me sometimes. I see their faces. You know, I, I hear their words. I hear their voices. And sometimes when I see their faces in my memories... Sometimes it's encouraging. And there's other times in my life where I've seen their faces in my memories, and it's been troubling because of what I was doing. You know, it, it, those memories didn't bring me happiness. They made me think of death. I, I still smell them. And over the past couple of years, I, I smell y'all too. I see your faces when I'm living my life. I hear your voices. I remember your faith. 
And sometimes those things are encouraging. And sometimes those things are discouraging to whatever I'm doing. Number two. Now, when we're dealing with hypocritical people and hypocritical faith, maybe bitter brethren or whatever you want to call it, do you see their faces too? I see their faces too. They live in my memories, and they discourage me too. And sometimes when I'm doing wrong, they're kind of helpful and encouraging, right? Because they'll steer you in that way. Everyone's having influence. And when I think about things like that, how I can remember bitter brethren, it makes me think for myself, well, if I'm going to be bitter, I'm going to have an influence on others. And I have to be wary of that. I have to be realize that this is a responsibility. People are going to smell my faith. And that could be for the better. That could be for the worse. And number three, obviously, we've got to bless with a lot of young people. Do I want all these young people to grow up one day and not really leave Gardell? I like, I like it when they stay, but, you know, they got a job somewhere else. They got to move away. Do I want them all to be faithful wherever they go? No, of course I do. You know, I think about it more than I even used to think about it. You know, hey, what do I need to be doing so I can ensure that these young people are going to continue the church forward wherever they may go? Are they all going to do it? Are all y'all going to do it? Can you promise to me right now? I, I don't know what the future holds of what you choose to do. Also, I realize this. I think I do have a pretty good influence on some of y'all right now. But I understand that there's going to come a day where I'm not going to have an influence on you anymore like I do now. I understand that there's going to come a time when you're not going to live around me. You're not going to hear me preach. You're not going to hear me talk to you. You're going to be gone. There also is going to come a time, one time that I'm going to be dead. And I'm not going to be able to even call you on the phone. If I did, it'd freak you out, wouldn't it? You know, I, there's going to come a time that's not even going to be impossible. And that kind of worries me. So this is how Andrew's reconciled with this using 2 Corinthians 2. You know, for you young people, there's going to come a point where Andrew's going to have no control over what you're going to do at all. But you are still going to smell me. You are still going to smell me. And you're going to have memories of me, right? And you're going to remember things I've said. You are going to see my face. And either that can be troubling or that can be encouraging. But you're going to have to make the choice of what your memories of me are going to be. Now, I'd like to think that you would have fond memories of me and you go, well, you know, Andrew, I'm, I'm thankful for what he taught me and I'm thankful for how he encouraged me. You know, he was a little weird, but hey, I'm thankful for it. You know, I'd be good with that. But I don't want anyone to smell me and make me. And Andrew was right. Andrew smelled like death. And when you start thinking Andrew smelled like death, maybe you would consider 2 Corinthians 2 just one more time. Because if Paul and Jesus smell like death too, well, then that says something about you. That doesn't say anything about me. Did I do Proverbs 22.6? Lord willing, I'm doing my best to do Proverbs 22.6. And I have a lot of hope that even though I may not have a lot of influence at some point, my smell will linger on. And your smell will linger on too. Thank you for your close attention. You can put up your Bibles if you like. You know, we were talking about how that would result with an influence of any Christian. But the main pot thought of 2 Corinthians 2 it is about Jesus and the apostles and the message of the gospel. Maybe for some of us, we have yet to obey the gospel, but Jesus does still smell good. And the apostles do smell like life. If you've gotten to the point where you agree that the gospel smells like life, well, you got to do what our buddy did. And you got to go, well, I believe in the Bible and I'm going to obey the gospel. And now it comes down to like Moses, you got to make a choice, right? You got to choose the life that you can have. If there's anyone here that's ready to choose life, and you like for the congregation to assist you with that, whether that be prayers or by obeying the gospel, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?